In our last two discussions, we looked at attempts to state necessary and sufficient conditions that allowed one to distinguish a thing of the world as art versus thing, a thing of the world as non-art. A somewhat different approach was taken by George Dickey, philosopher specializing in aesthetics and 18th century taste, and Stephen Davies, a philosopher specializing in aesthetics and music. In this discussion, we'll take a brief look at their ideas that can be situated under what is generally called an institutional theory of art. In doing so, we'll be seeing the term, quote, conferring the status of art, end quote, meaning to bestow the condition of art or state of affairs upon something. George Dickey believed that a thing was a work of art when certain conditions were fulfilled. These are, one, the thing is an artifact. By artifact, he means a human-created thing. This thing can be something made or found. Two, the thing is created and presented to the art world public. Three, this public is comprised of people who understand the object presented to them. For example, curators, museum people, critics, and so forth. Four, the art world system is a framework for the presentation of art to an art world public. And five, the art world is a totality of all art world systems. Behind all of this is the artist, who Dickey says is someone who understands the making of a work of art within this system. So basically, if an artist makes something tacitly agreeing to be part of the art world, and the artist puts the thing into the art world systems and before the art world public, and if the art world public or a representative for it, such as a major curator, says, yes, this is art, then the thing is art. Marcel Duchamp in 1917 bought an ordinary urinal and displayed it as art with the title Fountain at the exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists. He had some things going for him that a plumber who installed urinals did not. First, Duchamp was an artist who knew the art world. Second, Duchamp inserted his work into that art world in this example at the exhibition. The plumber was neither an artist who knew the art world, nor was the plumber installing the urinal in a restroom in an attempt to situate the urinal within the art world. Members of the art world, board members of this society, initially did not agree the urinal was art. Thus, it was removed from the exhibition. Later, art world experts agreed with Duchamp that the urinal was art, and they called it a type of art, a ready-made. In this example, the creation and conferring of art status upon the urinal generally meets the conditions set out by Dickey. Dickey also points out that this process of conferring art status isn't entirely easy and glib. The person on behalf of the institution called the art world who confers the status of art takes responsibility for that conferring, and many may judge the person right or wrong. If wrong, there's the possibility nobody will appreciate the conferrer's viewpoint, and the conferrer will lose face. Generally, Dickey saw his theory as value neutral. Anything could be art if it was put forth for evaluation as a possible candidate to receive the status of art. This solved one problem of White's open concept. It provided a definition with some conditions, even if a loose definition in which everything could be art. Dickey was critiqued on numerous grounds. For example, who exactly were the public experts to be given the authority to confer the status of art? What if experts disagreed? What about conferring art status on some mundane object? What if an artist said the thing was created as art but no expert agreed? More fundamentally, the theory was seen to be a form of circular reasoning. A thing was art if someone said the thing was art, but to call a thing art presupposed the expert knew what things were art and what things were not art. This, in turn, presupposed some unstated sets of necessary and sufficient criteria, and we're back to White's critique of theories on this point. Finally, it seems art required a public. To press this a bit, evidently someone living alone on a desert island couldn't make art. Finally, the idea was critiqued for not telling us what a work of art was, but rather 
telling us the social context into which a work of art could be situated. Stephen Davies looked carefully at Dickey's theory, and he decided that Dickey was basically right regarding the institutional theory. Davies added some conditions of his own that listed the manner in which a thing could qualify as a work of art. A. The thing shows excellence of skill and achievement in recognizing significant aesthetic goals as its primary identifying function, or it contributes to the realization of that function. A thing could be art even if it falls outside of all recognized categories, and it has some purpose other than contemplation for its own sake. For example, think of a beautiful sword. B. The thing falls under an art genre or form established and publicly recognized within an art tradition. Thus, paint on a canvas would be like art of the past that was paint on canvas. C. The thing is intended by the maker or presenter to be art, and the maker or presenter does what is necessary and appropriate to realize that intention. This view was explored in detail by Christy Mag Weeder in his book Art and Art Attempts. In it, he says, if an artist intends to make art and fails, the thing is not art. For example, if someone intends to construct a doghouse, but it cannot function as a doghouse, it is not a doghouse. Davies appears to support the fact that both artists and experts, as such by their knowledge and experience, can confer the status of art on a thing. Or, the thing can be art if it fits with historical forms. Or, the thing can be art if it shows and proves its excellence of skill and achievement in recognizing significant aesthetic goals and becomes the subject of aesthetic contemplation. Davies gives us an example uh, of a pattern that is simply decoration versus a significant aesthetic goal. Although he recognizes that a significant aesthetic goal can exist alongside things that have other functions, decoration on a serial ceremonial sword, for example. Davies says when the dominant function is practical, the thing is not art. Cars, for example. Only the most superb examples of cars are accorded art status. In agreement with Whites, Davies thought the tradition that sought to define art only in terms of aesthetic properties was misguided. The art world was relative and changeable. In his view, any attempt going forward needed to pay attention to, so to wider social settings, and especially those that fell outside of the art world known as high Western art, meaning art of Western Europe and North America. That said, Davies holds there must be something common to all works of art around the world beyond the fact they are products of their social institutions. A few of the same questions we've seen with Dickey also arise with Davies. What actually constitutes a significant aesthetic goal? Look up the Sorites paradox. One million grains of sand is a heap. A heap of sand minus one grain is still a heap and so on. How do you know when a heap ceases to be a heap? Right? So, how does one know that the work of art has aesthetic properties or fulfills art's function? How do we know it does so enough? Does this not in itself presuppose necessary and, condition, and sufficient conditions of aesthetic qualities or function that one might recognize or assess? Who gets to consider or confer the status of art on a thing, and when do they become an expert? Isn't being an artist presupposing we know what an artist is? As always, these become dense philosophical questions that deserve further consideration. Finally, we will look at an important critique of the institution and the conferring of art status raised by Thomas McEvely, critic, poet, and novelist. In 1984, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City put on a show titled Primitivism in the 20th Century. Affinity of the Tribal and the Modern. McEvely wrote a devastating review titled Doctor, Lawyer, Indian Chief, taken from the title of a popular 1945 song. McEvely pointed out that African tribal masks were connected to systems of belief and ritual, and that these connections were denied 
in their appropriation by the European artists who saw the masks as source material. This view is reinforced by the museum exhibition that displayed the masks without labels or explanatory text. The primitive masks were not presented as serious art, nor did the museum or artists acknowledge the masks functioned within religious or magical contexts. The masks were not, he said, intended to function within art history. The institution conferring of art world status upon the masks as things in themselves to be used as source material or displayed was not sufficient nor should be sufficient to make the masks art for the Western world.